Our journey continues in the most romantic of places, 19th century Paris, on a brilliant summer morning. It's the 1st of June, 1885. The city's population already awake and full of life, beginning their day as the quickening hues of sunrise fill the sky. The markets are setting up shop for the day. The florists have opened their doors wide. The horses' hooves tip-tap in as people go here and there. If you listen very closely, you can hear the oscillating tones of an accordion playing Le Mer in one of the many city squares somewhere. It is a very important day. And now, before we begin, do you want the good news or the bad news first? Ah, an optimist, and quite right. Let's get the bad news over and done with quickly. The man I have taken you to meet is, unfortunately, dead. We are too late and he has already passed. Today is the day of his funeral. It will be a state affair and we'll make sure we pay our respects later. But the good news is, he left us the key we require. And even better, he left it with some useful explanatory notes. The man in question was a national giant and loved by many. It's likely the majority of the city's population will make an appearance and pay their respects today. And we will too. But first we need to open this package and examine the key. So let's... Sorry, what? I made a mistake. Lemur cannot be playing in the distance because it was not recorded until 1945. Ah, good spot. But I'm not lying. Listen closely. Can you hear it? You can, can't you? Anachronism. The representation of someone as existing or something as happening in other than chronological, proper or historical order. An error in respect to dates. Any error which implies a misplacing of persons or events in time. Hence, anything foreign to or out of keeping with the specified time. Time is becoming strange. Now, the man in question, he was, undeniably, one of the greatest gatekeepers that ever lived. There is much dispute as to whether this man was actually a Freemason. Some writers claim he was, while others claim he was a Rosicrucian or Martinist. But his work is steeped in rich references and imagery that recall Freemasonry. And, most importantly, his entire modus operandi in regard to his work screams Freemason. Meet Victor Hugo. Victor Hugo is still, to this day, celebrated as one of the greatest writers that ever lived. And rightly so. Many are directly and indirectly familiar with some of his most famous novels. Specifically Les Miserables and Notre Dame de Paris, or what has otherwise come to be known as the Hunchback of Notre Dame. And despite his shady involvement in shaping the big lie we have all come to regard as factual history, the prowess of his literary ability is undeniable. Even in translation, Hugo's command over language makes his English counterpart Charles Dickens pale in comparison. A true literary giant. You see, before the invention of television, the citizens of the world needed to be entertained and manipulated in some form or another outside of journalism. The 19th century novelists were just as pivotal in shaping the historical narrative as the historians. They molded and shaped the narrative for the everyday person and presented it in a digestible and exciting form before the droll and tiring academic historians could begin shaping their institutionalized syllabuses. The novelists were at the forefront of building the lie for the general population. And it's the same method of programming that we experience today. How many of us have actually plowed through the historical archives in search of our history? And how many of us have not done that, but come to know the past through movies and television series? If you familiarize yourself with 19th century literature in general, you will soon learn that fiction, the novel, the novella, and poetry functioned in a similar way to our television programs and movies. 
in the sense that they one enabled readers to enjoy stories usually melodramatic or romantic in style that are engrossing but also set within the context of a not so accurate history this is a very clever tactic of manipulation and many movies such as Gone with the Wind, Braveheart, Forrest Gump and others have successfully employed since. But it was the writers of the 19th century that invented this method of captivation and manipulation by setting a fictional story within a supposedly factual historical context. Or in other words, writing a lie within a lie. Examples of this kind of macro historical programming include Les Miserables in which Hugo sets his story of multiple interwoven fictional lives amidst a historical backdrop beginning with Napoleon's defeat in 1815 and culminating in the June Rebellion against the monarchy in 1832. The novel is infamous for its lengthy digressions, which make up over 900 of the 2,700 pages of narrative. These digressions take the form of essays, in which Hugo muses on topics such as the Battle of Waterloo and the plethora of orphans in 19th century France. We have, therefore, a writer weaving a very readable piece of fiction, and within this framework, interweaving various essays that solidify the false narrative. And the reader, already enamored by the fictional story, has no choice but to make their way through these essays for fear of missing key narrative developments with the fictional characters they have come to love. And many writers employ this exact macro-historical programming technique i.e. embedding their story within a much larger historical narrative. We see it in Leo Tolstoy's chronicle of the French invasion of Russia and the impact of the Napoleonic era in War and Peace. It's there in Dickens' account of the French Revolution in A Tale of Two Cities and in James Cooper's The Last of the Mohicans. And two, the novel became a perfect medium for the higher-uppers, the cultural elites and masons to play their little games and hide things in plain sight. For those that like to question the validity of the historical narrative, Victor Hugo's novels read like a series of coded messages. We have the voice carrying the main storyline, which is firmly embedded within a historical context and that the everyday reader eagerly absorbs. And then another parallel voice, the one in the know, and speaking to others also in the know. So much of what you are looking for is hidden, in many ways, in the literature of the past. And in order to get the most out of some of these writers, I'd like to introduce you to a couple of literary techniques to look out for, and that will assist you in your own time. All the clues you are looking for are buried in the literature. It's all there in the fiction, waiting to be deciphered and pieced together. We will primarily use Hugo's Notre Dame de Paris as an example. We will cover some of these techniques first, and then we will discuss the key he has left us. And please bear with me. As we continue, you will see that I am neither reaching with or stretching these examples to fit a theory, but rather the contrary. Before we delve into this, let me introduce Hugo's Notre Dame de Paris a little in case you aren't familiar with it. It was published in 1831, but the entire events of the text are set at the end of the Middle Ages, specifically 1482. And it's during this time period that the Renaissance is starting to gain momentum. This is a similar time period in which the Jesuits and astronomers are beginning to build the heliocentric lie. The text is anachronistic in nature. Hugo frequently compares and contrasts his current era, the 19th century, with the bygone era of the Middle Ages, in which the events of the novel take place. The overall melodramatic plot of the story centers around a tangled web of infatuation, in which three central characters, Claude Frollo, the Archdeacon of Notre Dame Cathedral, Captain Phoebus, one of the king's high-ranking knights, and the disfigured bell-ringer Quasimodo, love and lust after an orphaned Romany street dancer named Esmeralda. 
With these three men competing for Esmeralda's love, things can only, of course, end in disaster. And it's in this tangled web of infatuation that Hugo weaves complex and subtle ruminations on our hidden history. The first of these techniques is the use of anachronism. Hugo's entire text is anachronistic in the sense that it is set in 1482, but the narrative voice of the book is very much of the 19th century. The most common type of anachronism is an object misplaced in time and Hugo's Notre Dame de Paris contains many of them. There are many descriptions and sentences that are out of place and context. And Hugo uses anachronism not to progress the story he is trying to tell, but instead to progress the false historical narrative. For example, upon first seeing the mysterious character Esmeralda dance in one of the city's squares, the writer Gringoire exclaims, if he had had all the riches of Peru in his pocket, he would have certainly given it all to the dancer. But Gringoire did not have Peru, and anyhow, America had not yet been discovered. Gringoire's reference to Peru here is out of place in the year 1485. If we are to believe the historical narrative, then the Americas and Peru were not discovered yet. A character in this time period should not know of Peru, it would have been more realistic for him to exclaim if he had all the riches of the King of France. But Hugo uses the riches of Peru, a seemingly useless and unrealistic image, for no other reason than to reinforce to his 19th century audience that the Americas were not discovered in 1482. Anachronism is one of the primary techniques many writers in the 19th century, especially Sir Walter Scott, employed to build and shape the historical lie to an unbeknownst audience. This is Hugo fulfilling the duty he was hired for. But there is another Hugo in this text, a more mischievous one, that cannot help himself. And if we look closer at a lot of the imagery within the text, and from our own perspective, then we see just how mischievous Hugo dares to be. This next technique is something I call hiding within the figurative. When I say figurative, I mean within the descriptions, the similes, the metaphors. You remember how the Bible frequently employs the image of giant trees to describe the Nephilim? This is an example of hiding within the figurative. Hiding a potential truth within descriptive language itself the writer's own subtle form of hiding in plain sight. Dickens does it at the beginning of Bleak House, when he describes the muddy London streets, as if the waters had but newly retired from the face of the earth. And it's everywhere in Hugo's Notre Dame de Paris. For instance, when staying in the towers of Notre Dame Cathedral, under the protection of Quasimodo, Esmeralda's grief is transformed by the tolling of the huge bells at the top of the towers. The bells above all soothed her. It was as if these huge machines poured over her some powerful magnetism, so each sunrise found her move at peace, breathing more easily, less pale, all her inner wounds healed. How very interesting, the vibrations and frequencies of these huge machine-like bells pouring over her a powerful magnetism that restored her to good health. You see, hiding within the figurative. And the entire text is full of examples such as this. Hugo at once stretching figurative language to paint a rich portrait of medieval Paris and also having a little fun of his own. The Ile de la City of Paris is described by Hugo as like a great ship stuck in the mud and stranded with the current near the middle of the Seine. Ha! Huh, stuck in the mud, you say? And as the crowd approaches the Palais de Justice, Hugo describes them as a flood of people. To onlookers watching from their windows, he writes, the crowd presented the appearance of a vast sea into which a dozen streets, like so many river mouths, continually disgorge fresh streams of heads. The waves of this human flood, constantly spreading, broke against the corners of houses. 
In the center of the tall, gothic facade of the palais was the grand staircase. Up and down it flowed continuously a double stream, breaking on the central flight of steps and then spreading out in broad waves over its two lateral flights. The staircase poured ceaselessly into the place like a cascade into a lake, the current driving the whole crowd towards the grand staircase ebbed, broke into turbulence and eddies. With our current theoretical understanding of the old world's potential use and reverence of water, this passage immediately becomes highly interesting. Through the use of simile, people are compared with a flood of water, and in doing so, Hugo transforms the streets and roads into flowing water systems. Staircases of old structures become cascades, water pours throughout the city panorama ceaselessly, ebbing and flowing, spreading and breaking against the architecture. Furthermore, the use of flood imagery here is reminiscent of Dickens and his opening to Bleak House and immediately conjures up images of the biblical flood and the strange and elusive mud flood. And it really leaves the curious wondering, what did Hugo know? Is Hugo telling us that these structures were flooded or is he telling us that most of the roads were not what they are today? But Paris used to be more akin to Venice, a vast water metropolis. Again, hiding within the figurative. Look out for it. There are many instances waiting to be found throughout 19th century literature. And some are very, very interesting. And then there is partial disclosure. Often, and throughout Notre Dame de Paris, Hugo's narrative will often stray from the drama at hand and branch into deliberations regarding the architecture. And in doing so, he often divulges information that we, the reader, should not be aware of. He won't give us the whole picture, of course he won't, but he will go so far as to confirm certain suspicions. For instance, in discussing Esmeralda's imprisonment, Hugo writes, In the Middle Ages, once a building was completed, there was almost as much of it in the ground as outside. In cathedrals it was, as it were, another cathedral underground, low, dark, mysterious. These mighty buildings, whose method of formation did not simply have foundations, but, so to speak, roots. Thus churches, palaces, fortresses had earth up to their waists. A building cellars were another building. Writing in the 19th century, what Hugo confirms here to his 21st century audience is what the so-called conspiracy theorists have been shouting about for a long time. That these cathedrals, palaces, castles do not end where they meet the ground, but keep going and not just for a few meters, but that they are buried very deep into the ground, buried in earth up to their waists, as Hugo so aptly puts it. And this is partial disclosure because, while Hugo will not tell us why these structures are half buried in the ground, his explanation of them being built this way in the Middle Ages does not cut it. He does confirm that yes, Indeed, they carry on down into the streets below us, and they go deep. And as the novel progresses, it becomes very evident that Hugo's descriptions of Paris and its architecture such as this are not coincidental. He knew exactly what he was doing with this text, and it becomes even more evident in the final literary technique I want to discuss before we look at the key. This technique is allegory. Allegorical metaphor, or allegory, is a device that many writers use to convey semi, hidden, or complex meanings through symbolic figures, actions, imagery, or events, which together create the moral, spiritual, or political meaning the author wishes to convey. And while it sounds complex, you are most likely very familiar with allegory, for instance, in his classic children's novels, C.S. Lewis employs allegory in the form of the lion Aslan, whose death and resurrection parallels that of Jesus Christ. George Orwell's Animal Farm is a political and satirical allegory of communism during early 20th century Russia. 
To understand Hugo's use of allegory in Notre Dame de Paris, we need to look a little closer at the novel's central characters. The first character, and without a doubt the most infamous, even to those unfamiliar with the text, is Quasimodo. Quasimodo is an orphaned outcast, banished from society due to his disfigurement, who lives in Notre Dame under the patronage of Claude Frollo, the archdeacon. Quasimodo is described by Hugo as having a large head bristling with red hair, between his shoulders an enormous hump. He has a tetrahedral nose, a horseshoe mouth, irregular teeth. He is as broad as he is tall and displays a perfect ugliness. As Hugo writes, he looked like a giant, broken into pieces and then badly mended. Throughout the novel, Hugo describes Quasimodo's size as gigantic, often depicting him as a kind of cyclops. Quasimodo is our typical friendly giant. On the outside he is hideous, but on the inside is kind and warm. He is also bewildered and in love with Esmeralda, the Romany orphan who generates her living by dancing in the city streets. Esmeralda dances and performs street magic with her pet goat. And while the Parisian locals do love to watch her perform, they also suspect her of black magic. They call her the Egyptian, the witch, the pagan. And then we have Quasimodo's master and patron, Claude Frollo, who holds a position as Archdeacon of Notre Dame. He is a tall, slender, creepy, controlled and bitter man. He is secretly in love with Esmeralda and stalks her quietly in the shadows. There is a darkness surrounding Frollo and he is one of the narrative's key antagonists, a tragic villain. He also has a secret. As the narrator explains, the inhabitants of the city would often see a strange, intermittent red glow appearing, disappearing, reappearing at short, regular intervals, coming from one of the high towers of Notre Dame Cathedral, late into the night. The old Parisian women would exclaim, there's the archdeacon at his bellows, hell sparking up there. The locals describe Frollo as a sorcerer, but he prefers the title of alchemist. I hope you remember our reading of Falconelli's The Mystery of the Cathedrals and the Metals. And like all alchemists, Frollo is obsessed with turning lead into gold. Gold, he explains, is the sun. To make gold is to be God. The sun is born of fire. Fire is the soul of the great whole. Light, gold, the same thing. Fire in its concrete state. The difference between the visible and the palpable. The fluid and the solid. For the same substance, from steam to ice, that's all. Like Falconelli's work, we have Hugo placing the figure of an alchemist in the Middle Ages at work directly inside one of these huge, magnificent cathedrals. And not only that, but we have a portrait of an alchemist obsessed with the sun, and he describes the sun as being made from the same source that produces gold. Frollo claims that like steam is the fluid and ice its solid, the sun's fire is the fluid and gold is its solid counterpart. Interestingly, Hugo spends time in the novel lamenting the destruction of the statue of St. Christopher, or, as I hope you remember, Ophorus, that used to reside within Notre Dame, and who came to symbolize the great connection between alchemy and the cathedrals. In stark contrast to Frollo, we finally have Captain Phoebus, a high-ranking knight for the King of France. Phoebus is of noble birth, handsome, vain, arrogant, untrustworthy, and also a womanizer. The women love him, he gets what he wants when he wants it. He is not in love with Esmeralda, but he does lust after her sexually and is determined to seduce her, to use her, and then forget her. Phoebus is the second antagonist of the story. Enamored by Phoebus's handsomeness and confidence, Esmeralda, of course, falls madly in love with him. And what is very interesting is Hugo's decision to call the captain Phoebus. In Greek mythology, Phoebus is the god of the sun. In Roman mythology, this god is called Apollo. 
and in a weird, twisted turn of events, Phoebus not only seduces Esmeralda, but also allows Frollo to hide in a closet and watch. But Frollo has other plans than just watching Esmeralda be seduced. In a frenzied rage of jealousy for her love of Phoebus, he bursts from the closet and attempts to stab Phoebus to death. Phoebus does not die, but survives, and the blame falls to Esmeralda, and in turn she is sentenced to death by hanging. Frollo's attempt to kill Phoebus, and the blame falling to Esmeralda, sets in motion a dramatic chain of events that leads to Esmeralda being rescued at the last minute by Quasimodo, and taken to Notre Dame Cathedral, where both orphans seek asylum. But this is not enough, and the entire plot spirals into chaos, resulting in both orphans dying gruesome deaths, and Notre Dame Cathedral set ablaze and burning. Now, remember, an allegory is a literary technique in which the writer conveys hidden or complex meaning through symbolic figures, actions, imagery or events. It is a narrative in which a character, place or event is used to deliver a broad message about real world issues and occurrences. And at first glance, it is not exactly clear as to why Hugo's entire plot here is allegorical, but if we apply our master key, then we pave a path into understanding his message. What we have here is a host of symbolic characters or figures who Hugo renders as representative of burgeoning tensions that emerge during the end of the medieval world. We have the character Phoebus. He is indifferent, arrogant, handsome and glorious and everyone gravitates toward him especially the dancer Esmeralda, who loves him to the point of reverence. If Hugo's choice of the name Phoebus directly places the character as a personification of the sun above our heads, then his characterization of Esmeralda as a pagan Romany traveler, who the locals of Paris called the witch or Egyptian, is symbolic of pagan sun worship. Romany is linguistically very close to Roman. Hugo ensures that his reader indirectly associates this figure with the sun-worshipping practices of ancient Egypt and Rome. But like the sun itself, Phoebus is indifferent to Esmeralda's or any kind of worship that is directed his way from his pagan admirers. We then have another form of sun worship in the figure of Claude Frollo, who personifies the corruption of the church and its integration of sun worship through his occult practices as a cathedral alchemist. He is obsessed with discovering the secrets behind the sun's formation and its relationship to the metal gold. Frollo's love for Esmeralda and her rejection of him in favor of Phoebus represents alchemy's futile ambition of trying to create heaven on earth, of overreaching by playing God, of trying to master the sun that it can never match. It can try, but alchemy will never achieve that of the sun. And Frollo, the alchemist, consumed by envy and dwarfed by inferiority at this realization, then attempts to kill the sun. And in doing so, sets off a chain of events that leads to the downfall of many of the characters, culminating in Esmeralda being hung at the end. And who are the victims of the whole story? It's not Esmeralda, her reluctance to acknowledge the emptiness behind her sun worship behind her passion for the light, leads to the suffering of the real victims of the tale. And that is, first of all, Quasimodo, the red-haired giant who is ostracized from society and whose only real connection is with the cathedral where he lives and its bells. The second is the cathedral itself, which ends up ignited and ablaze with fire. On top of the highest gallery, higher than the central rose window, rose a great flame between the two bell towers with swells of sparks, a great ragged furious flame. The worship of the light and the attempt to dominate the sun result in the downfall of the old world, symbolized here by Quasimodo and the cathedral. Interesting, isn't it, that Quasimodo is depicted as a red-haired giant. We also have the recurring motif of sun worship and this time an attempt to kill the sun, 
who of course does not die. He is damaged and forever changed, but still returns unconquered. Damaged and changed. Hmm, how interesting. Phoebus is the unconquered sun. Why do we find the sun throughout historical monuments, literature, and mythology represented as unconquered? Hugo's allegory of the end of the Middle Ages both at once places the sun as a central catalyst to that end and reinforces the importance of key figures such as the alchemist, the pagan, the church, and giants in this time period. I hope you are starting to see just how pivotal Hugo's text is for those of us trying to navigate the muddy deception dumped over our history. And I cannot emphasize it enough, if you are trying to get anywhere with this, then Notre Dame de Paris is required reading. You will go around in circles without it, and I'm about to show you why. The key Victor Hugo left us. Can a high ranking gatekeeper develop a conscience? Can they pause and regret the direction the world is heading? The direction that they themselves played an invaluable role in steering us toward? Perhaps. The most interesting pages of Hugo's Notre Dame de Paris are found in two of the main essays he incorporates into the fictional fabric of the text, titled Notre Dame and a Bird's Eye View of Paris. It is in these essays that Hugo ruminates, reflects, and discusses how the medieval Paris that existed before the Renaissance was in full swing differs from his contemporary 19th century Paris. And Hugo was not impressed or happy about the contrast. In fact, he was rather appalled and angry. Let me read you a few excerpts from these essays. No doubt the Church of Notre Dame de Paris is still today a sublime and majestic building. But for all the beauty it has preserved in aging, it is hard to repress a sigh, to repress indignation over the countless degradations and mutilations which time and men have simultaneously inflicted. On the face of this old queen of our cathedrals, beside each wrinkle you will find a scar. Time devours, man devours still more. Out of the various traces of destruction imprinted on the ancient church, time share would be the least, that of men the worst, especially men of the art. From the offset, Hugo laments the mutilation of Notre Dame and draws in the sand for us a very real distinction between the weathering at the hands of time itself, the wrinkles we see on the structure, and the barbaric destruction at the hands of man, especially men of the art. Hugo walks his reader up to the top of the cathedral, asking them to pay attention to the countless acts of barbarity of every kind. What have they done, he asks, with that delightful little steeple, which used to stand at midpoint of the crossing. An architect of good taste amputated it, he replies, and thought it enough to conceal the wound with that large leaden patch that looks like a saucepan lid. And now Hugo gets into full swing and starts putting a lot in context and perspective for us. Really pay attention to what he now says. That is how the marvelous art of the Middle Ages has been treated in almost every country. Gothic architecture is, today, disfigured by three kinds of ravage. Wrinkles and warts on its skin are the work of time. Marks of violence, brutality, contusions, fractures, the work of revolutions and war. Mutilations, amputations, dislocation of its limbs, restorations, are the Greek, Roman and barbaric work of professors and fashions. Fashions have done more harm than revolutions. They have cut into the living flesh, attacked the bone structure of the art underneath. They have hewn, hacked, dislocated, killed the building, in its form and in its symbolism, in its logic as in its beauty. And then they remade it, brazenly, in the name of good taste. 
They stuck over the wounds of Gothic architecture, their wretched baubles of a day, their marble ribbons, their metal pom-poms, a veritable leprosy of overloads, scrolls, surrounds, draperies, garlands, fringes, stone flames, bronze clouds, chubby cupids, bloated cherubs. It is the arse kicking the dying lion. It is the old oak decaying, as a final blow being stung, bitten, and gnawed by caterpillars. The first thing that needs to be addressed here is that Hugo will not give us the entire truth. He will not clearly describe what the old world actually looked like, who its citizens were, how it functioned in terms of government, everyday life, its technological capabilities, and just how much it differed from the 19th century. This he will not do, this was not his job, and he would never have gotten published if he did. Any real secrets of the old world have been delegated to hide within the figurative and will not be addressed front on. But, as these passages make explicitly clear, Hugo was outraged by just how much the old world had been ravaged, mutilated, destroyed and erased by his current 19th century day. And you might be thinking, what? What is this Hugo man talking about? I've seen the old photographs of 19th century Paris. It's marvellous. You clearly have not seen the photographs of the Parisian World's Fairs, have you? Don't worry, I've seen them. We will get to that, but let's first focus on what Hugo is telling us here. What he clearly outlines for us here is that one, there is a huge distinction between the Gothic architecture of the Middle Ages, which ended in the 1400s before the Renaissance began, and the style of architecture that followed. And two, that which followed has focused on disfiguring the Gothic structures. They have hacked, dislocated, and killed those Gothic structures of the past by remaking these structures according to new and more fashionable tastes which he so wryly mocks as marble ribbons, pom-poms, chubby cupids, bloated cherubs, and so on. And three, these fashionable restorations are primarily Greek, Roman, and belong to the barbaric work of professors. Hugo's mention of Greek and Roman here is a direct reference to the Renaissance. The term Renaissance has been allocated by historians to a period in history that marked the transition from the Middle Ages to modernity and covering the 15th and 16th centuries, characterized by an effort to revive and surpass ideas and achievements of classical antiquity. The Renaissance spanned from the 1400s to the 1500s, and, as many historians have stated, it was characterized by a revival of classical antiquity after a long thousand years of the Dark Ages, where there was little or no technological advancement, we are told. The first thing that should ring alarm bells for anyone is the term Dark Ages. The term was coined by Italian scholar Petrarch as the Middle Ages were ending, in which he claimed that amidst the errors there shone forth men of genius, no less keen were their eyes, although they were surrounded by darkness and dense gloom. Petrarch capitalized on the Christian metaphor of dark versus light and branded the thousand year long period of the Middle Ages as darkness and the new burgeoning renaissance as the light for its cultural aspirations and achievements. You see, during the renaissance, man no longer needed to humble himself in front of God. Humanity had now entered a new age and it was brimming with possibilities and exploration. Society was expected to show their reverence to God through their ambitions to exceed the boundaries, through cultural, technological, and scientific advancement. And it was during this new age that humanity broke free from the alleged strict piety that characterized the Dark Ages and started to see themselves as God incarnate, of masters of their own universe, no longer bound by the dark, but fully committed to the light from dark to light. Thus, it was during the Renaissance that man came to see himself as a god or god's equal. But, as Hugo makes clear, for all its emphasis on advancement and revival, 
the Renaissance actually built itself on the decaying backbone of what preceded it, the medieval Gothic Age. The Renaissance's revival of classical antiquity, specifically that of the ancient Roman style of architecture, was all show, all surface, all facade and decoration, pom-poms, draperies, garlands and ribbons. And this is where alarm bells should start ringing again, the revival of classical antiquity. Who or what rose again? The Empire of the Sun rose again. Rome. You see, the great little lie in the history books is that the people we see in these photographs and those that came before built these structures through pure innovation, with horse and cart, with wooden scaffolding and apparatuses, through traditional methods of masonry. They did not, but the great big lie is a complete suppression of those that actually invented everything those that were conquered and whose entire history was mutilated and erased after they fell. As the conquerors began repurposing all of their structures and infrastructure with the intention to hide, reshape, redesign and make claim to their heritage. There is a very clear distinction that needs to be made regarding the impossible structures of the past, of the structures that we have discussed so far. And this distinction is that there are at least two very distinct styles, two distinct factions, two distinct old worlds. Both magnificent, both wondrous, both technologically impossible by our standards. And we cannot fully grasp this until we have walked through the first door. But, on the surface, they are easily recognisable. And while it does not fully capture the complexity of this, one of the best ways to recognize this distinction is through the arch. Gothic architecture is characterized by pointed structures. Its arch is pointed. Its enormous cathedrals rise into towers and pointed spires. Whereas the classical style of Rome and Greece favors rounded arches, rounded domes, and a vast amount of decadence, often accompanied by statues of Phoebus, Venus, Zeus, Apollo, and so on. These are not the same style, they did not belong to the same society, and they are in fact directly opposed to one another. And I know what you want to say, what? You told us that the citizens of the future belong to one unified civilization. I know I did, and again forgive me, but I needed you to firstly contemplate the impossibility of these structures, and secondly consider the alternative technological functions they could have held. Too much complexity would have confused matters. But we are after the nuance now. A unified civilization. Huh, sounds a little like globalism, right? No, these structures right here, these are not the fruits of the same society. They are, in fact, in direct opposition to one another. The Gothic belongs to one and the classical to another. So far, I have not done justice to just how complex the matter actually is. Go on, I know you want to say it. What if this Hugo man is a liar? You even said yourself he was a gatekeeper, likely a mason or an elite deceiver. What if his little novel about a hunchback was written to throw us off the scent? I know, and you're right, he cannot be trusted. His job was to bring the fabricated history of France alive to his 19th century readers. Where he is lying with this novel, however, is in depicting the Middle Ages as a period of stern religious sanctity, of archers, knights on horseback, of the Crusades. He does not explicitly outline for his readers what the Middle Ages was actually like. But, as his works show, he was haunted by its decimation, its destruction and erasure for most of his life. Victor Hugo did not just write fiction, he was a strong activist, actively attempting to prevent the widespread, organized, and very real destruction of the old medieval world that continued to take place well into the 19th century. In addition to Notre Dame de Paris, Hugo wrote several non-fiction essays on this subject that everyone should read. 
One in particular, titled The War on the Demolishers, is very important. As he writes, at this time, there is not a single town in France, nor a single administrative centre where the destruction of some historical monument is not in consideration, already begun or fully achieved, either by the action of the central authority or by the action of the local authority under the consent of the central authority or by the action of individuals under the tolerant gaze of the local authority. The devastators have never been lacking for justifications. Under the Restoration, Catholic edifices of the Middle Ages were spoiled, mutilated, disfigured, profaned more sanctimoniously than anything in the world. The congregation developed the same excrescence on their churches as they had on their religion. These mutilations consist of marble, bronze, whitewash, and gilded wood. It appeared most often in churches, in the form of a little painted chapel, gilded, mysterious, elegiac, filled with puffed up angels, coquettish, gallant, plump, and awash in false daylight, like the one at Saint Sulpice. In Paris, vandalism flourishes and prospers under our very gaze. Vandalism is an architect, vandalism settles in and luxuriates, vandalism is feted, applauded, encouraged, admired, entertained, protected, consulted, subsidized, paid for, naturalized. Vandalism is the public works commissioner for the government account. He has slyly installed himself in the budget and he nibbles quietly at it like a rat does his cheese. And of course he makes good money. Every day he demolishes something of the little that remains to us of that admirable old Paris. What do I know? Vandalism slavered paint across Notre Dame. Vandalism altered the towers of the Palais de Justice. Vandalism amputated two of the three spires at Saint Germain de Prix. Vandalism has his newspapers, his coteries, his schools, his pulpits, his public, his truths. Vandalism has a bourgeoisie on his side. He is well fed, well funded, swollen with pride, almost wise, ever so traditional. A good logician, a strong theoretician, happy, powerful, attendant to his needs, well spoken and content with himself. He protects young talents. He is a professor. He awards the great prizes of architecture. He sends students to Rome. He wears an embroidered frock. He is a member of learned societies. He attends court. He lends an arm to the king and strolls with him through the streets, whispering plans in his ear. You must meet him. One no longer restores, one no longer even spoils, one no longer even makes ugly, one simply tears down. And one has good reason for this. We wish to erase it all fully from our history. We devastate, we pulverize, we destroy, we demolish in the national spirit. It's in Hugo's essays that the implications of the key he has handed us start to really flourish. What we learn in Hugo's ranting, raging animosity towards the destruction of the old medieval world is that one, it is still continuing well into the 19th century and primarily takes the form of amputating sections of structures and redecorating them in neoclassical facades. When repurposement is not possible, the structures are simply torn down. And that two, this is not arbitrary, random destruction and repurposement, but calculated, planned and organized. It is factored into the budgets of local and national authorities across France and by extension, the whole of Europe. Hugo makes clear that the budget to destroy, repurpose and erase that of the old medieval world is seemingly endless and well protected, even to the point that organizations send students to Rome to study and emulate these styles back in France. There are prizes for repurposement. It is encouraged and normalized through newspaper propaganda and through the education and religious systems. And as the essay continues, the enormity of just how much has been changed since the Middle Ages really starts to dawn on the reader. 
It wasn't just in the Renaissance, the 15th and 16th centuries, that the rise of neoclassicism and its aspiration to erase the old world of the Middle Ages dominated the social spirit of the time. As Hugo Riley states, As for the edifices that we build in place of those that we destroy, we will not accept the change. We do not want it. They are wretched. All the monuments of the 17th century, even as much as they are an improvement on those of the 18th and far beyond those of the 19th, whatever their good airs, whatever their grand impressions, the monuments of Louis XIV are like his children, many among them are bastards. As you can see, this repurposement agenda continued through to the 17th, 18th and was still occurring in the 19th century. We are looking at 500 to 600 years worth of destruction, revision and repurposement. The claim that there was a reset in the 19th century greatly miscalculates, underestimates and simplifies a very complex agenda that spanned half a millennium and that was comprised of a series of smaller resets, all working towards the goal of erasing the old medieval world and building and solidifying the mode of society that we find ourselves in today. And so what, you might want to ask, who cares when the reset began and when it ended? Paris and most of the world that we see in the 19th century photographs looks glorious. All that matters is they have lied and hidden years and years worth of technology and knowledge from us. I agree, the Victorian era is glorious, but by our standards. And if what we see in the Victorian era was the apogee of civilization, then what is Victor Hugo so angry about? And why does he outline that there has been a repurposement agenda ongoing since the 1400s? What were they repurposing, hiding, editing, destroying and erasing? Why was he so angry in the 1830s? What did he know? What came before the Renaissance's revival of the classical style? Just because the world looked glorious in the 1800s and there is a lot of evidence to suggest that those between the 1400s and 1800s were way more technologically advanced than the history books tell us they were does not mean we should disregard the complexity surrounding the issue. It matters for multiple reasons but primarily because having a clearer timeline can help us start to classify, differentiate between and define what we mean when we talk about the old world. Are we discussing the thousand year long period that had been lost, destroyed, swept under the rug and tarnished as the dark ages? The thousand year period in which the immense and beautiful pointed architectural style of Gothic was born or are we discussing the 500 year period of destruction, revision, repurposement and revival that followed? This cathedral is very different structurally and stylistically to this colonnaded building. If there was a case to argue for a thousand year long millennial reign of a civilization, an argument for coherence and solidarity, it is to be found here. This period, however, is half a millennium's worth of rebuilding and revision. It is here we find imperial hegemony, dominance and authority over what came before with an agenda to erase it from history. And the only way this was accomplished was through multiple population resets. This period, the 500 years that followed the Middle Ages or the Dark Ages, was the age of the Great Transition. Anatoly Fomenko once wrote that history is nothing but our model of the past and we need a better model, one that attempts to do it justice. Not everything in the history books is a complete fiction. The Renaissance, the Enlightenment, the Victorian era were all very real. They haven't told us the whole truth about these time periods. No, of course they haven't. There is a reason they tell us a camera was not invented until the 1800s. But these eras did exist and were part of the Great Transition. And be very careful about making conclusions too early in regard to a millennial reign. 
just in case you end up glorifying structures that played an integral role in supplanting, replacing and burying that very same millennial period you are celebrating. The structures that were built, revised and repurposed during the Great Transition are not representative of a thousand years of peace and we will get to that much later. There is one more element to this key that I'd like to introduce before we open the door and walk through. In Notre Dame de Paris, Hugo muses on the written word itself. So many of the systems integral to our mode of living today were introduced in the Renaissance. Not only did the astronomers and church redesign our conception of the universe, not only were our methods of timekeeping firmly established, not only did the financial system that we are still beholden to today become dominant, but the printing press became critical in establishing a new mode of information communication, that of the written word. In probably the most outstanding chapter in the entire novel, Hugo declares that the invention of printing is the greatest event in history. Printing will kill architecture. Now, listen very carefully to what he says. This is so critically important. Architecture began like any system of writing. First it was an alphabet. A stone was set upright and that was a letter. Later on, words were formed. Stone was laid upon stone. These granite syllables were joined. Language tried out a few combinations. Finally, they produced books. And they grew, multiplied, intersected, becoming more and more complex. Thus, he continues, during the first 6,000 years of the world's existence, architecture was a great script of the human race. This book of granite began in the Orient, and the last page was written in the Middle Ages. Architecture, up to the 15th century, was the principal record of mankind. During that time, no concept of any complexity appeared in the world which was not made into a building. But then printing arrived in the Renaissance, and the printing word, gnawing like a worm at its buildings, sucked and devoured it. As architecture diminishes, so printing swells and grows. So as early as the 16th century, the printing press, grown now to equal stature with declining architecture, fights and slays its rival. By the time the 18th century draws to its close, the printing press has destroyed everything. In the 19th century, it will rebuild. Thus, to sum up what we have said so far, mankind has two books, two records, two testaments, masonry and printing, the stone bible and the paper bible. The past must be reread on those marble pages. Can you now see why it was perhaps necessary for those who conquered to change and repurpose so much? Not only to destabilize, destroy, and hide the entire infrastructure of the old world, but also to scatter and shatter the stories and accounts these structures silently spoke, to disband their testimony, and then rewrite a fabricated history and propagate this information widely across the world through the medium of the printed book. And that's a very disturbing notion. What if there was a Bible written in stone? And wasn't that precisely what Falconelli was referring to? That the cathedrals had a message written in stone that testified to an alchemical, technological past. But what if they testified to more than that? Books can be burned, but stone can also be altered, facaded, torn down. And here lies a major issue for us in the 21st century. How to read the stone books of the past if the great transition scattered their message. We must learn to read, but the language we must first master is that of repurposement and revision. We will continue to chase our tales unless we start to differentiate between the old medieval world and the great transition that followed. There is so much waiting to be discovered in making this distinction. And now Hugo has given us the key, we can walk through the door and attempt to do this. But before that, it's time to pay our respects. His funeral is underway as we speak. 
And, as you can see, a huge amount of Paris' population is here in mourning. Hugo was a national giant, a towering figure of letters, who wrote Paris the lie into life, who was of the same cloth as those he came to despise. Can a gatekeeper develop a conscience? Hugo's daughter was confined to an insane asylum. His two sons, wife and mistress also died, all within a very short time frame. And then it was his turn. A couple of days before he died, Hugo wrote, To love is to act. Did his love for the old, bygone world of the Middle Ages spur him to action, to protest its demise at the hands of its conquerors? Did he become just a little too rebellious? Did he start to forsake the gate he was instructed to keep? And did his family suffer as a consequence? Perhaps, perhaps not. We'll never know. And here we are again, in front of the Arc de Triomphe. Hugo's funeral procession began here, an ironic and objectionable location to commemorate a man who detested the fruits born of the neoclassical great transition. This arch, it is not a magnet, it is not old world technology, it was constructed in the era it was said to be built. It was not built by those using traditional masonry, horse and cart, no, that is the lie. But the arch gates of the old medieval world were different and held another function entirely. This belongs to and does not predate the great transition and served one primary function. Bewildering in its impossibility, yes, in its gargantuan size and its juxtaposition with the tiny people at its feet, yes, but unapologetic, arrogant, monstrous and imposing. The final declaration of imperial dominance and victory over the old medieval world. A seal of triumph. A moment of jubilation frozen in cold stone. Its audacious pride barely concealing its sole function. To mark the return of Rome. How many of these triumphal arches of the same style can be found across the world? Start looking at the dates of when they were put up. They were erected to declare the completion of a 500 year long reset in many locations around the world. But this one looks different on this day, wouldn't you say? Can you see what they've done? They added the Sun Chariot, the unconquered Phoebus, the Sol Invictus at the top of the arch here for the funeral. We do not see this statue in photographs of the arch taken in 1860. 25 years before Hugo's funeral, so why now? And look at the catafalque, created to carry his coffin beneath the arch. It's fit for a giant and the largest and most decadent I've ever seen. Can you see how they've decorated it with a large sun? They are mocking him with the very same Roman decadence and grandiosity the marble ribbons, draperies, garlands, pom-poms, and bloated statues that Hugo actively protested against. They mock him as they mock us today. When we began this journey of ours, I told you that piecing together an accurate picture and timeline of our lost history is like trying to solve an impossible Rubik's Cube. This was not hyperbole on my part. They have worked very hard to bury a thousand years of our history by tarnishing it as the Dark Ages. The complexity of what we are dealing with is overwhelming. But that's not going to stop us from trying, right? So let's start rotating those cubelets. We need to start with Europe before we widen our investigation. We need to start differentiating between the old medieval world and the Great Transition. We need to start establishing definitions and time frames to look closer at each period here and to forensically examine the very fabric of repurposement. Otherwise we will forever continue to do a great injustice to the past they have tried to destroy. Come on, the first door is open and it's time for us to walk through. A kaleidoscopic labyrinth awaits us, the two books of mankind and it's about time we learned how to read. Hold on now, and I'll see you on the other side.